Good evening and welcome to California Today. I'm David Lam, sitting in for Liang Zhang. Let's take a look at some of today's stories. The Supreme Court is making lots of news today. After the ruling about concealed carrying of firearms, one lawyer says what she expects anti-gun groups to do in the state. And speaking of guns, I went to an active shooter training event today. They taught law enforcement how to coordinate with other teams that they don't usually work with during an emergency situation. Now that Roe vs. Wade is out, all sorts of comments are rolling in. We'll hear from both the governor and one expert. Groups are taking action following the Supreme Court's recent ruling that people have the right to carry firearms in public for self-defense. But some Californians are ready to challenge that ruling. Entity's Daniel Hall has a look at how people are reacting. The Supreme Court struck down New York State's limits on carrying concealed handguns outside the home. The ruling upheld the Second Amendment and recognized, for the first time, a constitutional right to carry firearms in public for self-defense. But one attorney for a pro-Second Amendment group anticipates gun control advocates may challenge the Supreme Court decision. We are looking at other uh, litigation that could be brought because uh, the way this case came down, it wasn't just for um, concealed carry. It also put a new test on all Second Amendment cases now uh, where those courts now have to go back and decide whether or not a new law is act was actually a historical precedent at the time that the Second Amendment or the 14th Amendment were passed. Chevron said she expected several gun control measures currently stayed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit to be ruled on or handed back to lower courts. We have uh, magazine bans there, ammunition cases there, um, assault weapon cases, 18 to 21 year olds being able to purchase firearms. All of those cases are kind of in line right now at the Ninth Circuit. and They've all been held until this case comes down. Meanwhile, Democratic leaders in California had prepared legislation in anticipation of the decision. Governor Gavin Newsom says lawmakers will now fast-track the most restrictive rules allowed under the Supreme Court's ruling. We've been working closely with our attorney general, with legal staff, as well as legislative leadership to ready and craft legislation that will be heard next week to protect our public carry law and defend the rights of Californians. Newsom additionally criticized the Supreme Court's ruling. Recrafting our laws with the premise that we exist in the 1700s, a time, as Justice Breyer pointed out, when most Americans lived on farms or small towns, well, a time when being armed meant muskets, crossbows, still ladders, landscapes, and dirks. However, Chauvin says the right to bear arms is protected under the Constitution. She adds that people who obtain permits to carry concealed firearms go through background checks. There are millions of gun owners in the United States right now, and none of them are going out and committing crimes. None of them are um, doing anything illegal. They are lawful citizens that have the right to bear arms. And they also have the right now, the Supreme Court has said it, to bear arms outside the home and protect themselves. But California Attorney General Rob Bonta says restrictive gun laws were working. He cited per capita data on gun death rates, which put the Golden State at 44th lowest among the 50 states. But according to both FBI and CDC statistics, California had the highest total death count of any state in 2020. Chauvron says it's all fear-mongering. So the fear-mongering kind of that's going on out there right now, where some groups are saying, oh, this is going to be devastating, um, it's going to increase gun violence. That's simply just not true. California currently has the highest number of gun laws with 107. Massachusetts follows closely behind with 103. And Connecticut ranks third with its 92 gun laws. Idaho was the least with one gun law, followed by Mississippi and Missouri with two. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. Local and federal agencies gathered in a small California city for an active shooter training seminar. Today, I went to see how officers from different agencies learn to work together when addressing various life-threatening situations. About 40 different agencies participated in this annual active shooter training 
to prepare officers on the front line. This is the program's 10th year. It's to stop the threat. Uh, that's that's the first and foremost is to just stop whatever the the the, the threat is to the, the the people that are in the area. It's over a week long training in Scotts Valley, just south of California's Silicon Valley. The training is for first responders to get together and work in unison with different departments when responding to incidents. Follow the front side in. Follow your front side in. Open door left. Open door left. Fine. The training includes local and federal agencies. Here, first responders clear out the rooms. Clear on the right, clear on the right, moving up. Now this active shooter training is currently held locally at Scotts Valley High School. Some officials want to improve and strengthen the program by getting statewide support. School shootings should be very, very rare. Unfortunately, in our world these days, they're not so much. So it is time that we built a common approach to a response. And when you look at the protocols that they're putting together. When responding to incidents, officers from different jurisdictions may come together and having proper communication is key. And we feel like this is so important with hundreds of, of officers and uh, other service providers, first responders benefiting from it, that if we could get consistent funding, it would allow us to continue this program consistently. The officials hope the program can continue to receive funding each year so different departments across the state can ensure standard protocols and close to real experience to keep the community safe. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Police in San Francisco arrested a man who is the alleged shooter in a deadly transit shooting on Wednesday. Entity's Jason Blair reports. The San Francisco police announced Friday morning that a suspect has been arrested in a fatal shooting that happened on a San Francisco Muni train. Authorities booked 26-year-old Javon Green on June 23rd as the alleged shooter. On Wednesday morning, a Muni train was en route when a shooting took place on the train, ending with two people being shot. After the train stopped at Castro Station, the shooting suspect reportedly fled the scene by foot. Of the two shooting victims, one was treated with non-life-threatening injuries and one was pronounced dead at the scene. Although the suspect has been arrested, SFPD are still asking anyone with any information to contact them. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Many, including Governor Gavin Newsom, are not happy about it. He has talked about turning California into an abortion sanctuary state. Newsom, along with governors from Oregon and Washington, announced that they will do what is in their power to continue with abortion. Here's what he had to say about the legal changes. A little less sorry than I am resolved and angry uh, to do more and to do better. During the conference, he signed a new bill, AB 1666, that protects abortion providers and their patients that come from other states from being sued. In May, Newsom proposed a $125 million reproductive health package to prepare for the influx of women seeking reproductive health care from other states. On the other hand, the head of the Right to Life League says she was happy about the changes. I know that they have the my body, my choice, but for me, the baby also has a fundamental right. And I know that to some people that feels like then you're sort of stripping away the rights of the mother. I believe we really as a, uh, you know, as a nation need to come together behind women and provide resources. Since becoming the group's president, Brennan has put her legal background to work providing advice to the network of crisis pregnancy centers, anti-abortion medical clinics, and maternity homes the organization represents. A Tesla went up in flames in a Northern California junkyard. Firefighters put it out at once, but it kept reigniting. Authorities doused the fire with thousands of gallons of water. A Tesla Model S spontaneously burst into flames at a junkyard earlier this month. The Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District used about 4,500 gallons of water to put out the blaze. The vehicle was involved in an accident three weeks ago and sustained major damage. It was in the junkyard for dismantling. According to Metro Fire, crews knocked the fire down, but the car kept reigniting and off-gassing in the battery compartment.
Residual heat caused the vehicle to keep reigniting. Battery-powered vehicles are known to be notoriously difficult to deal with when they catch fire. Gas-driven cars catch fire more often, but the fires in electric vehicles burn longer. In the end, responders dug a small pit, put the car in, and filled it with water, submerging the vehicle's battery compartment. The fire was eventually extinguished, and no injuries were reported. Tesla has recently found itself some bad press with two separate lawsuits from former employees. One accuses Tesla of racism, while the other says the electric car maker violated labor laws. Here's a look. On Tuesday, Owen Diaz rejected a $15 million settlement with Tesla in order to open the possibility for a new trial. He is a former elevator operator at Tesla's flagship California assembly plant. Diaz's lawyer said in a statement that even the $15 million settlement would not be enough to deter future misconduct from Tesla. Diaz alleges that a torrent of racial slurs was directed at him in the company's workplace. The previous jury awarded what would have cost Tesla $137 million. $6.9 million would have been for Diaz's compensatory damages and another $130 million levied against Tesla for punitive damages. But U.S. District Judge William Oreck said a trial award of that number was too excessive. A jury award of that amount would have been one of the largest of its kind in a discrimination case. Diaz is not the only employee suing the company. Last Sunday, a lawsuit was filed by Tesla employees alleging the company's decision to carry out a mass layoff violated federal law as the company did not provide a 60-day advance notice of the job cuts. Over 500 employees were terminated at Tesla's Gigafactory plant in Sparks, Nevada, according to the lawsuit. A 60-day notification period for mass layoffs is mandated by federal law under the Worker Adjustment and Restraining Notification Act. Tesla as a whole is looking to cut staff after CEO Elon Musk said earlier this month that he had a super bad feeling about the state of the world economy. He also called the lawsuits trivial. We're taking a short break, but here's a look at what's coming up next when we come back. Two former police officers have been accused of bounty hunting illegally. They are said to have kidnapped the girlfriend of a person who didn't make it to trial. And a man survived a shark attack with the help of some good Samaritans. We'll look at how they risked themselves for the life-saving efforts. That and more on California Today. Two former California police officers have been accused of kidnapping along with several other charges while working illegally as bounty hunters. They kidnapped a woman, seemingly in an attempt to lure out her boyfriend. Two former Orange County police officers are facing allegations of kidnapping while working illegally as bail fugitive recovery persons, commonly known as bounty hunters. 49-year-old Roger Jeffrey Corbet and 34-year-old Kevin Andrew Peterson were attempting to locate an individual who missed court appearances. They allegedly kidnapped and handcuffed the girlfriend of the suspect, then drove her around for several hours. Despite presenting themselves as bounty hunters, neither Corbet or Peterson had completed the state requirements. Authorities are still investigating the incident where the two were hired by a licensed bail agent. According to the California Department of Insurance, Corbet and Peterson are facing criminal charges of kidnapping, false imprisonment by violence, menace, fraud or deceit, and enhancement with firearms. Corbet was given a pretrial diversion sentence in February 2021 after being charged for filing a false police record covering up a former city manager's DUI car crash. Peterson was fired in 2018 by the Anaheim Police Department after shooting a man to death following a chase. The state is now considering Assembly Bill 2043, which requires bounty hunters to be licensed. A prominent San Francisco high school will be restoring its merit-based admission system. It will abandon its recently adopted lottery system. In a 4-3 to three vote, the San Francisco Board of Education decided on Wednesday to restore Lowell High School's admission system. In 2021, the school board decided to make the lottery-based system permanent for the 2023-2024 to 2024 school year. But after public backlash and a recall of three board members, the decision was reversed to keep the merit-based system. Students applying to Lowell must have a certain grade point average and standardized test score in order to qualify for admission. 
The board also approved a task force to improve the school district's portfolio of high schools. It will last 12 months with a goal to improve policies, practices, and programs for better student outcomes. Bayer, the producers of Roundup, suffered a major setback this week. A California man's lawsuit was upheld by the highest court. Edwin Hardiman of Windsor, California had his lawsuit upheld in the U.S. Supreme Court. He'll be awarded $25 million in damages. For 26 years, Hardiman used the company's weed killer product, Roundup, at his home in Northern California. He was then diagnosed with a form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He filed a lawsuit in 2016 blaming the weed killer's ingredients for his diagnosis. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, had upheld that the ingredient, glyphosate, is not a public health risk if used as directed on the label. A San Francisco court ruled that Bayer was at fault, which prompted them to file an appeal in the U.S. Supreme Court. But justices rejected the appeal. In a statement released on Tuesday, Bayer expressed their disappointment with the decision, saying that they should not be penalized for a product that the EPA deemed safe. But the company is still taking measures to take the ingredient out of their product by 2023. Bayer has another petition pending in the U.S. Supreme Court on a related issue. California is working on its largest floodplain salmon-rearing habitat restoration in state history. Its purpose is to create a habitat for the endangered species. The Department of Water Resources and U.S. Bureau of Reclamation partner to work on the Big Notch Project. It is a 30,000-acre floodplain habitat restoration and fish passage project in the Yolo Bypass in Yolo County. And so this is really an important project to provide connectivity between the Sacramento River and the Yolo Bypass uh, to open up additional habitat for both salmon, uh, sturgeon, steelhead, and other, other species. The project aims to create a habitat for the threatened and endangered species. The Yolo Bypass, as you all know, is a key component to protect the greater Sacramento area and has been for many, many decades. So now we're embarking on a new use of the Yolo Bypass that can be done in conjunction with this primary and initial purpose of providing valuable flood control for this greater area in Sacramento. Part of the Big Notch project includes removing a section of the Fremont Ware State Wildlife Area, installing three gates, carving out 180,000 cubic yards for salmon, and constructing a control building and pedestrian bridge. The notch, or gated passage, will open when the Sacramento River is high enough to flow into the Yolo Bypass floodplain. The water would create a shallow habitat for fish migration, allowing young salmon to eat longer and grow quicker. This would improve their chances of survival in the Pacific Ocean. In our culture, we believe that, you know, when we come to these places, uh, being native or non-native, you know, we want to make sure we come in a good way. We want to make sure that we um, let the people know and the, and the spirits that believe in these places that uh, we're here to um, create a relationship with the earth, with the spirits, with uh, one another. The project is expected to finish in late 2023. Hero bystanders helped a man after he was attacked by a shark in Monterey Bay. The man survived, but with serious injuries. Good Samaritans rescued a California man after he was attacked by a shark at Lover's Point Beach in Pacific Grove on Wednesday. The man, identified as Stephen Broomer, sustained significant injuries from the shark bite, but survived. He has since been hospitalized. Jill Hanley, a friend of Broomer's, told local Fox affiliate KION that he is a 60-year-old retired professor. Hanley said to KION that it was a very large shark. Luckily, none of his blood vessels were intruded upon, but his femur was broken and they were able to fix it. But it is going to be a long recovery. KION published two short videos taken from a nearby beach house showing good Samaritans on paddle boards making their way to Broomer's location in the water soon after the attack. The police chief thanked the Good Samaritans who took immediate action and personal risk to help the swimmer. Monterey Fire deployed a drone to search for the shark, but it was not located. Police said that the beach will be closed until Saturday under State Parks protocol. Now to Entities Thomas Christian for an update on sports. I'm Thomas Christian, giving you the California Today Sports Roundup. 
The picks are in for the 2022 NBA Draft, which took place Thursday night, and every California team has at least one new face coming into their locker room. The Sacramento Kings were first up with the fourth overall pick in the draft. They selected Keegan Murray out of Iowa, who looks to be a solid wing prospect after averaging 23.2 points per game in his second college season. A strong amount of that production came out of his ability to space the floor, while shooting an excellent 39.8% from three-point range. At 6'8", 215 pounds, Murray fills a position of need for just about any NBA team, but will be especially valuable for Sacramento. Solid wing players that can shoot are hard to come by, and if Murray pans out for the Kings, they have gotten themselves a nice piece to bolster their roster. The other first round selection from a California team came at the 28th overall pick. The Golden State Warriors drafted Patrick Baldwin Jr. out of Milwaukee. At 6'10 and somewhere between 220 and 230 pounds, Baldwin is listed as a guard, although his size would put him a lot closer to a power forward or even a center at the NBA level. Playing for Milwaukee in the lowly Horizon League, Baldwin Jr. was seen as a project player coming into the draft, someone who has the tools to become a good player in the NBA in the future, but isn't all the way there quite yet. He averaged 12.1 points and 5.8 rebounds in his only college season on a pretty terrible 34% field goal percentage. There is hope, however, because his team at Milwaukee ran virtually every play through Baldwin something that he will not be asked to do at the pro level. The Lakers added Max Christie with the 35th overall selection in the second round, a 6'5 shooting guard out of Michigan State. An excellent defender, Christie will likely get some opportunity straight away, with the Lakers squad looking for anything that can shake up its roster. Also selecting in the second round was the LA Clippers, who took Musa Diabate, a 6'11 forward out of Michigan. He averaged 9 points and 6 rebounds in his only college season. Later on in the draft, most of the prospects taken will be either sent to the G League or to develop as bottom of the roster bench players. Diabate will likely get that treatment from a Clippers team that will be looking to compete for a title next season with stars Kawhi Leonard and Paul George being fully healthy. Golden State took two more players at the bottom of the draft likely to go in the same way as Diabate, with Ryan Rollins out of Toledo and Guy Santos from the Brazilian basketball club Minas. Rollins is a 6'4 combo guard that needs to work out his jump shot, while Santos is a 6'8 wing player that has shown great speed and athleticism, but will need to add some weight if he wants to get minutes in the NBA. And that's all for the California Today Sports Roundup. That's all we have for tonight. You can join us again on California Today every weekday at 8.30 p.m. If you have any news tips or ideas for our show, feel free to let us know. Our email is california.today at ntd.com. I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Liang Jing. Have a wonderful weekend.